Hello and welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm your host, Deacon Adolfo Carvajal, and our topic today is poverty, or rather, helping people rise up out of poverty. And Christians among us are doing a wonderful job in trying to accomplish this. And with us today to discuss this is Joan Jones, the Executive Director of Love in the Name of Christ of Clackamas County. Thank Joan, you. Thank, thank you. you for having me. And thank you for being here with us. As I said, you know, not, it's not just, you know, talking about poverty, but lifting yes. people out. And so oftentimes we look, we, we turn to the government for all these other different things. But, but this lies squarely in the hands of the people of, of God to do. And you've, uh, you've accepted that challenge and you're moving forward. I absolutely agree with that. that this mm -hmm. is a work that the church can be so in invested in and produce results that the government could never even dream to achieve. Oh, sure, of course. Well, the passion of Christ does not necessarily exist in bureaucrats. That's right. But uh, let, let's, get a, let's get an overall mm -hmm. view and vision. How did, how did love in the name of Christ um, as a ministry emerge? Yes. So it was formed in the Midwest in the 70s by a group of churches who recognized that they continued to meet the same needs for the same families year after year. And they, they had a gentleman named Virgil Golke, who was a social worker and a Christian and attended a local church. And he brought the churches together saying, if we can do this together as a community of churches, recognizing that together we can do much more, we won't duplicate services, we can uh, maximize our resources, and then we can bring the gospel into the mix of alleviating poverty. So he began Love in the Name of Christ. It uh, went very, very well in their little area of uh, the country. However, they really wanted to expand it outside of their borders. And they became under the umbrella of uh, World Vision for a time. And under that care and feeding, they grew. And now we are a national organization. We are no longer under uh, World Vision. Each of the 150 affiliates around the country are a uh, independent nonprofit board. They come into a community. They have to have at least six different distinctive denominations that serve on that board. And then they mobilize churches to provide resources for the community that are not being met presently with the resources that are there. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's been in Clackamas County for 10 years. So it's mm -hmm. been a, a thriving ministry there. I guess, I guess um, love in the name of Christ is, is maybe an answer to, to, to the struggles that mm -hmm. oftentimes churches feel in their benevolence ministries mm -hmm. when after a period of time they just feel they're, they're not really helping, just, just enabling people who are stuck in that, in that spiral, that circle of poverty. You are exactly right and that's exactly the purpose and mission of loving is to try to dig a little deeper. Why are people in chronic need and how do we assess that and come mm -hmm. alongside them? Not We have given we meet about a, over a thousand families a year with material services such as beds and firewood and furniture and bicycles but uh, after time that really is not addressing that deeper need and so mm -hmm. we build relationships with folks outside of just providing things and try to um, build a friendship with them mm -hmm. and assess, so what is driving this? You know, is there a broken marriage? Is there uh, unemployment? Has there been dependency generationally on subsidizing uh, the government? And so we offer life skills classes to kind of address that, maybe budgeting help or parenting help, mm -hmm. and then uh, other assistance that we recognize meet that deeper need that's driving mm -hmm. poverty. Let's, let's, uh, let's unpack that deeper mm -hmm. need a little bit. Oftentimes when we talk about poverty, we always point to all these external exactly. pressures, uh, chemical dependency, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. What about that deeper need for, for identity and community that people have? How does, mm -hmm. how does love in the name of Christ address that? I'm glad you asked. So we recognize that every human being is impoverished mm -hmm. because of the brokenness that came through the fall of, of man mm -hmm. and his uh, rebellion to God. So not only do we recognize that this deeper poverty need is resident in the people that are calling us, we recognize that the churchmen that are serving these folks are also struggling with poverty in some measure. So because we have that basis of understanding that everyone is in need of a spiritual assistance to reach, to come out of poverty, uh, to, to answer your question how we help clients with that poverty, we offer a class called Image, mm -hmm. which we explore the intrinsic nature of each person. Um, we do this with a 
eight week class, what we found is really powerful is we sit down with a dinner and we just sit cross table. The mystery of the dinner table is an amazing thing because there the people are all on the same page. Whether you're in the church, you've been in the church for 30 years and you're a deacon and you're strong and you're vibrant in your faith, or you're a person who maybe has never been exposed to the gospel. At the dinner table, we all recognize that we're people that have the same needs. So we offer this class about image where we can look at core values, uh, recognize that people made in the image of God and explore their st strengths. Mm -hmm. So they can bring their own skills and abilities to bear to helping themselves out of poverty mm -hmm. instead of just giving them things and thinking that's the answer. So what I hear you saying is that you, you level the relational playing field first yes. and in the process both minister and the person who's being ministered to receive assistance and affirmation and arrive at a deeper spiritual understanding is that's that that's exactly right yes mm, very interesting it's very powerful what now what kind of what kind of people um, mm -hmm. are you serving what mm -hmm. what are your demographics so when we first uh, came to Clackamas County we had a very strong bond with Department of Human Services which is wonderful however because we started there and maybe not getting referrals from churches we built a brand, I think, of serving people who are in chronic dependency on government assistance. And we want to continue to serve that population, and they really have real needs, and we offer uh, many helps to them. However, we recognize that we were getting late in the game with some of the folks we were serving. We're serving a lot of uh, single moms or people that have been uh, on government assistance for 20, 30, 40 years. It was hard to make inroads into addressing employment and um, stability in their lives. Mm -hmm. So we've been backing up and trying to find earlier and earlier ways to intervene to prevent homelessness, to prevent mm -hmm. some of the um, uh, issues that cause people to become homeless and mm -hmm. um, impoverished. So our aim, we've been, as I said, we've been backing up. So now we're meeting folks at about 2025 is what the targeted age that we're looking to serve. Mm -hmm. People that haven't developed patterns and lifestyles, maybe that keep them in bondage to poverty and, and assistance. So, you're, so you're, you're, you're reaching people right at that, that point of cognitive development mm -hmm. where, they, where they reach that, that, that place of maturity. And so... Um, how does this relational health that mm -hmm. develops uh, mm -hmm. through this ministry, how does it impact physical health? Mm -hmm. Well, you can imagine it's dramatic. It's all very holistic. We're mm -hmm. whole beings, you know, physically, social, emotionally, and spiritually. And we are embodied spirits. That's, mm -hmm. That's right. And so when we begin to address not simply you know, I need firewood, I need a bed. But we begin to address the social needs of people, which is one of the most significant aspects of our creatureliness, is that we are in need of others. And so when we come alongside people and train our volunteers to recognize, we're not asking you to fix anyone. We're not asking you to be, you know, patronize and, and lord over and show them if they just get their budget right, everything's gonna be good. No, the greatest gift you bring is yourself and your own weaknesses and strengths and just be a friend and we see people blossom. In fact, we have people that have been with us for three or four years who continue to say, what's your next class? What's the next thing you're doing? Because we've been able to build this culture mm -hmm. of friendship, which is, you know, I, I think of Jesus, you know, how he became a friend to us and that was the greatest gift he gave us to show us the way and give himself for us. So that's what we have found has been helpful for people who are on Red Bull mm -hmm. and who uh, don't sleep well and they don't exercise. But when you bring just friendship and say, hey, why don't you come with me to the gym or let's go do this together, they themselves improve in their own identity and a sense of well-being and mm -hmm. they get healthier. You know, the image that I'm, I'm getting out of this conversation is, is somehow this this ministry is able to restore relational health mm -hmm. in people mm -hmm. and perhaps by um, by recognizing the spirit of God within, mm -hmm. then they can see the spirit of God within others mm -hmm. as well. And just like that dinner table, it levels that yes. relational playing field. That's One. right. And so what's in store uh, for the future, for the ministry? What, what, where are you moving? What directions are you yeah, going in? We're very excited because after 10 years of serving beds and bikes, we've gotten a reputation that love in the name of Christ is a place of help. So because of that, uh, the, commu the community agencies have been reaching out to us in particular with these young folks that are aging out of foster care, uh -huh. kids that are at risk. We've gone to, we have 10 local school districts in Clackamas County 
And two years ago, we started a program called Lace Up With Love, where we provided new shoes for the over 1,200 homeless students in Clackamas County. So we built great bridges with the school districts. Mm -hmm. um, so through that means of developing those relationships, everything's about relationship, we are working on a program to come alongside young people that are on the threshold of coming out of foster care because they have the highest statistical risk for incarceration, unwed pregnancy, uh, homelessness, and building a friendship program with them to pair churchmen, church mm -hmm. people that are uh, being called by God to serve this population to mm -hmm. um, build friendships and support and maybe some vocational assistance, getting them on a trajectory of healthiness mm -hmm. and hopefulness. Well, Joan, you, you put everything, I think, into proper perspective. First is, first is relational health. And of course, you can't exclude the things either because no. that comes afterwards, mm -hmm. but in its, in its proper order. And as the ministry progresses, uh, surely you have needs mm -hmm. of, of material and financial goods. Uh, could you briefly tell us what those, uh, some of those needs are? Absolutely. We are volunteer donation based at our core and we will continue to be so. However, as we have expanded our services, our operational needs continue to expand. Uh, we're adding another staff member. So just operationally costs are always needed and we appreciate that. I will just share a real ambitious desire that we have. We right now are housed in renting a space in a church and we're kind of the teenager that needs to grow up and get their own place. Mm -hmm. And so on the big picture and we're just asking our community to consider getting our own visible presence within our community so that it can be a place for these young people to come and hang out with the church, to build skills, maybe in a coffee shop, something like that, so that that's a huge need, a big qu a quest that we are not capable of providing for, but I know that God owns all things, God and is. so we're asking mm -hmm. Him to provide that. Ask and you shall receive. Yes. Well, thank you, Joan, for being here with us today. And I think I, I might add also that Love in the Name of Christ uh, was awarded the Clackamas County Community Impact Award for Distinguished Service. Yes, we did. It was a great honor. <laughs>The mission of Love in the Name of Christ is to mobilize local churches and communities in the name of Christ to transform lives and communities. Love in the Name of Christ is a 501c3. We are completely funded by private donation. The reason we're doing what we do is we really want to benefit the people that we serve. But being privately funded, we're always scrambling for more and more resources because we want to really bring true help to the people that we're serving. We have about 10 resources that our churches provide, furniture, di diapers, bikes, firewood. Typically the people we serve have frayed relationships and they need more assistance than just giving them something. So we want to develop a more holistic approach. We offer some life skills classes. Our greatest desire is to incorporate some sort of industry into our ministry so that we can walk with people that support services and encouragement while they learn how to do job training, become ready for the workforce. We eat dinner with them, we serve them, they serve us. We develop relationships with people that are not necessarily church-based, they're just oriented toward how can we be together in this neighborhood. I have been changed by the people I've known and coming to understand so fully that people are the same. They laugh at the same things, they cry at the same things, they need the same things. And when I sit at a table with somebody and for most of my life thought I was somehow, I, I don't think superior is how I felt, but maybe blessed to be on them and came to understand and know them and know they are up beyond me in so many ways. So I think it's been profound and I invite people to experience that too because it will change you if you participate in a way that is meaningful. Welcome back. We continue today's program with Cindy Holt, the program director of Love in the Name of Christ. Thank Hi. you, Cindy, for yeah. being here with us. Yeah, thank you for you, having me. And so we're going to continue on. Okay. And I think I think Joan did a wonderful job of giving us a broad overview of, of Love in the Name of Christ. 
But, um, but the issue and the topic that I think we should discuss on this part of the program should be youth. Okay. So let's, let's go into a little bit more of the specifics uh, about how um, this ministry reaches out to young people. Okay. Um, again, I'd like to just touch, as Joan mentioned, we have been working with families that have kind of just gotten stuck. And it just kind of has been on our radar after a while to see how can we begin to um, get ahead of these patterns of stuckness that we were seeing. Uh, we had an intern that um, interned with us a couple of years ago, and she was actually ended up was a foster child mm -hmm. who had aged out of foster care. Was one of the rare statistics of actually uh, obtaining a college degree. She helped put on our radar the needs of youth aging out. So we began to explore what are the needs because Loving's mission is to, to tap into unmet needs in the community mm -hmm. and we recognize that this is indeed a very vulnerable population. So in partnership with the county and um, other community partners we began to explore how we might be able as the church to walk in um, and be of service to these young people. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful how you're able to identify that need. Yes. We always hear people talking about helping foster children, mm -hmm. foster children, mm -hmm. but nobody ever says anything about foster children after they're after. out of the foster home and then now we have family-less. Yes, and statistically, mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty grim. Uh, one in five of those young adults um, after 18 are homeless within a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, by the age of 24, over half are still unemployed, and their risk for incarceration, mm -hmm. um, physical, mental health issues, drug and alcohol dependency is just it's pretty prolific in that group and over 70 percent of the females are pregnant by the age of 21. Mm -hmm. All of those are continuing factors for getting entrenched and stuck in poverty. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that speaks to that main mission of the ministry and that is to create healthy relationships yes. Uh, yes. with people, especially with a segment of the population that, um, well, perhaps never really enjoyed a true healthy relationship with yes. self, much yes. less others. Yes, they have experienced obviously a sense of abandonment mm -hmm. and not a place of home and where they belong. And so it has been our, well, let me back up. The research shows that one of the number one protective factors for these young people is having social um, support mm -hmm. and getting connected to community networks. And most of these kids, by the time they're 18 and age out, they don't have any of that. And so that's why they're so vulnerable to falling into those statistics. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're the church and we are full mm -hmm. of um, people who love God and have been made to love one another. And we know the importance of relationship. So this is an area that we have been able to respond to and, and our churches are excited about it. Respond to, respond yes. primarily to the calling of Christ mm -hmm. within us yes. as, as, as his people. Yes. You know, let's, guarding confidentiality. Yes. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, wonderful success stories that people have, uh, have had mm. and among those success stories mm. what have you gleaned from those stories as those key moments those key transitions that took place in their lives well I'm gonna the, I guess the most powerful story because it was so up close and personal was our intern um, and uh, through her her own story was the importance of an upstairs. Uh, she was a young girl who came home in the age of um, 10 from school one day mm -hmm. to have the house totally empty. Mom was gone, all the things were gone, and she just stood there. Well, there was a neighbor upstairs who happened to be a pastor. And she went up there and uh, had nurtured a relationship with her over the time that she lived in that apartment complex and poured into her. Mm -hmm. Seeds were planted that, um, the story is incredible, but the seeds would be planted and although she determined at a young age, I know Jesus, um, I love him, and I'm not gonna fall into those statistics, she did. Mm -hmm. But at the age of 21, God showed up again in her life um, because of those seeds planted. Mm -hmm. And it was, the faith community, she can look back and tell you the powerful story of she, it was those key people along the way that provided her the stability, the hope, the reminder that she was loved and it had, it led to her being able to break her addictions to drug and alcohol, um, to get back on her feet and like I said, 3% of these youth 
make it to college and she's mm -hmm. that rare statistic. So mm -hmm. that relationship was a central mm -hmm. um, part of her success story, if you will. So how did, after, after all this took place, then mm -hmm. how, what, what's in the future for her? Is she continuing on in the ministry? Does she have a career? Yes, she went on mm -hmm. to become a social worker. Oh, okay. And she's actually uh, working currently with youth in the Native American population. Uh -huh. Has a big heart to give back. Uh -huh. So she's yes. pouring back. Oh, she is pouring back. 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 Yes. You know, one of the things that Joan talked about was was that that communal meal mm -hmm. uh, dynamic and how um, how that how that table equaled it, the yes. playing field. How yeah. do how do young people respond to that? Again, you're tapping into we're all made for relationship. God made us that way. Mm -hmm. And so when we um, connect with these young people, the hunger's already there. And again, when we sit at the table, we're seeing each other's face. Mm -hmm. You have a sense of place and belonging. And it just reminds you intrinsically that you are made for something bigger. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our kids get stuck. Life has been pretty messy, broken, and not a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. And when we sit at the table and we're sitting with people that are different than us, different ages, different races, different genders, different economics, mm -hmm. it broadens our horizons and, and it actually is a means for hope mm -hmm. because it isn't just what I've experienced. You get invited into a world mm -hmm. um, of opportunity. Has that been able to, to overcome some of the barriers to relationships? So many young people have endured exploitation and abuse of many different kinds yes. and so may have a, an intrinsic distrust it, of yes. other people who want to build relationships. Yes. How do you overcome that? Uh, that is one of our biggest commitments in terms of equipping our um, volunteers who come alongside is to e exactly that. Don't come in with expectations, agendas. demands, mm -hmm. agendas. You come to love and affirm. Uh, and it takes time to, to, to reestablish that trust. Uh, and so that's one of our main goals is just for these young people to know that they are loved. Mm -hmm. um, and it just takes time. Yeah. And, and we have to earn their respect mm -hmm. and earn that trust. For, and rightly for, so. Yeah. For Christians, uh, yeah. you know, we are also called to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. But just that process of proselytizing can yeah. can also bring up those those barriers, yes. and so you're able to uh, just focus on relationships. Yeah, and can I share a story about that? Sure, it was course. interesting. We had two young men. They're both 20, and they're six months away from aging out of foster care. And I had two young men who've offered to come alongside and offer friendship to them, and. One of the, the young men was, when we were all done, just introducing one another and excited about you know, the future and walking together. He said, can I just ask one thing? Are you gonna talk to me about God? And um, we're so appreciative of, because he knew he was coming mm -hmm. into the faith community, don't know his background, where he's coming from, and my young mentor said, I don't like that either when people just come and start there. Um, just brought down some of those concerns and fears. Um, but no, I'm honestly just here to be with you mm -hmm. and to be a, a support. And you could see the young man's guard just come down. But I so appreciated his honesty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's one thing that, that I have discovered in mm -hmm. my interactions with, with young people. They're, their honesty, oh, their right. honesty. Yeah. They will be the yeah. first one to say, "No, I'm an atheist." Yes, basically yes. saying, uh -huh. "I don't believe in the right. in the image of this God yes. that you have created yes. that fits your religious system." That's right. Or they'll say, "No, I'm I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual." Right. In, in other words, acknowledging that there's is something yes. out there yeah. that that they feel deep within. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we're confident. We don't change anybody's life. If God is the one who's going to come and work in that heart and change that heart, so. Mm -hmm. Our mission is to come and demonstrate that love of Christ and love for one another and trust that when the time comes um, and the words need to be spoken, we'll have earned a place to speak. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it has been said that that, uh, that faith isn't just desire, but mm -hmm. faith is action. Yes. And so uh, talking about the actions, how does the ministry, Love in the Name of Christ, uh, structure itself to be able to, to reach out to receive and to, I guess, enable mm -hmm. in the proper way mm -hmm. these children to the young people who have aged out of foster care to to be successful in their lives. By the way, what time do they, when do they age out of Generally, they care? age out at 18. Um, 
this population is now on the radar of the federal government, and uh -huh. there's about 18 states in the nation that are now recognizing most 18-year-olds are not ready to just jump out and successfully make it. So it has been extended in about 18 states to the age of 21, as long as they continue to be in school um, or working. So that's encouraging. Okay. Well, yeah, but good. generally mm -hmm. at about 18. And about 18. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, yes. Well, the, even yeah. that, in, in my opinion, I think maybe 23 or 24 would be a little bit better, well, especially well, in the actually, situation in which our, we live in yes, in our society yes. today. And children or young adults are taking longer to successfully move into just practical adulthood um, and economic stability. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have their families to yeah. support them. These or young or people develop don't broader have that. community where they're mm -hmm. at. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So, um, Tell us about some of the some of the needs that some uh, of the needs that the ministry has right now. Um, just in general, or in terms of the, our youth aging out. Well, with the youth, focusing okay. on the youth. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned before, the statistics are huge in terms of homelessness. Mm -hmm. A lot of these kids because they've been moved from home to home, school has been interrupted, often don't come with um, high school completed, or just some of the skills you need in order to make it successfully. So what is beautiful about what we are doing as we connect a young person with an adult is our commitment is to not only love them, but begin to know them and invite them to explore different possibilities to dream, what they might be interested in, um, and then informally and just in a natural, inorganic manner begin to see Hmm. what would be the next step to move them towards stable housing? Well, if they don't have a high school diploma or a GED, how can we start to move you in that direction? Um, if you're not working or college isn't on the radar, what vocation may be? So literally, it's a little bit slower, it's a little bit longer, it's taking one kid at a time and saying, how can we walk with this young person? Mm -hmm. um, we have a hu huge community mm -hmm. of gifts. God has blessed his people. Um, and trusting as we walk with a young person, we can respond to their particular needs. What's the next step to move you in the direction so that you're not homeless, mm -hmm. you're not um, becoming one of those statistics. And for volunteers, I guess you're going to need a very broad, very broad, very broad group of people that can yes. share many of these different. And I love gifts. it because we're a partnership of 40 churches, and we have those gifts. Good. They're out there. Well, thank you, Cindy, yeah. for being here with us and, and sharing with us the uh, what the people of God yes. is are, are doing yes. in our community and the yeah. positive impact they're making. Yes. God bless you and continue to you. enrich you and your yeah. ministry. And you too. Thank you. And we thank you very much for being with us here on Join Our Town. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Goodbye.